Flowers for Algernon, Progress Report 12, April 30th. I've quit my job with Donegan's Plastic Box Company. Mr. Donegan insisted that it would be better for all concerned if I left. What did I do to make them hate me so? The first I knew of it was when Mr. Donegan showed me the petition. 840 names, everyone connected with the factory except Fanny Gurdon. Scanning the list quickly, I saw at once that hers was the only missing name. All the rest demanded that I be fired. Joe Carp and Frank Riley wouldn't talk to me about it. No one else would either, except Fanny. She was one of the few people I'd known who set her mind to something and believed it no matter what the rest of the world proved, she said, or did, and Fanny did not believe that I should have been fired. She had been against the petition on principle, and despite the pressure and threats she'd held out. Which don't mean to say, she remarked, that I don't think there's something mighty strange about you, Charlie. Them changes, I don't know. He used to be a good, dependable, ordinary man. Not too bright, maybe, but honest. Who knows what you done to yourself to get so smart all of a sudden. Like everybody around here's been saying, Charlie, it's not right. But how can you say that, Fanny? What's wrong with a man becoming intelligent and wanting to acquire knowledge and understanding of the world around him? She stared down at her work and I turned to leave. Without looking at me, she said, It was evil when Eve listened to the snake and ate from the tree of knowledge. It was evil when she saw that she was naked. It was not for the it not for the none of us would she ever have to grow old and sick and die. Once again, now I have the feeling of shame burning inside me. This intelligence has driven a wedge between me and all the people I once knew and loved. Before they laughed at me and despised me for my ignorance and dullness. Now they hate me for my knowledge and understanding. What in God's name do they want of me? They've driven me out of the factory. Now I'm more alone than ever before. May 15th. Dr. Strauss is very angry at me for not having written any progress reports in two weeks. He's justified because the lab is now paying me a regular salary. I told him I was too busy thinking and reading. When I pointed out that writing was such a slow process that it made me impatient with my poor handwriting, he suggested that I learn to type. It's much easier now. It's much easier to write now because I can type nearly 75 words a minute. Dr. Strauss continually reminds me of the need to speak and write simply so that people will be able to understand me. I'll try to review all the things that happened to me during the last two weeks. Algernon and I were presented to the American Psychological Association sitting in convention with the World Psychological Association last Tuesday. We created quite a sensation. Dr. Niemer and Dr. Strauss were proud of us. I suspect that Dr. Niemer who is 60, 10 years older than Dr. Strauss, finds it necessary to see tangible results of his work, undoubtedly the result of pressure by Mrs. Niemer. Contrary to my earlier impressions of him, I realize that Dr. Niemer is not at all a genius. He is, has a very good mind, but it struggles under the specter of self-doubt. He wants people to take him for a genius. Therefore, it is important for him to feel that his work is accepted by the world. I believe that Dr. Niemer was afraid of further delay because he worried that someone else might make a discovery along these lines and take the credit from him. Dr. Strauss, on the other hand, might be called a genius, although I feel that his area, areas of knowledge are too limited. He was educated in the tradition of narrow specialization. The broader aspects of background were neglected far more than necessary, even for a neurosurgeon. I was shocked to learn that the only ancient languages he could read were Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and that he knows almost nothing of mathematics beyond the elementary levels of ca the calculus of variations. When he admitted this to me, I found myself almost annoyed. It was as if he had hidden this part of himself in order to deceive me, pretending, as many people do, I've discovered, to be what he is not. No one I've ever known is what he appears to be on the surface. Dr. Niemer appears to be uncomfortable around me. Sometimes when I try to talk to him, 
He just looks at me strangely and turns away. I was angry at first when Dr. Strauss told me I was giving Dr. Niemer an inferiority complex. I thought he was mocking me and I'm oversensitive at being made fun of. How was I to know that a highly respected psycho experimentalist like Niemer was unequated with Hindustani and Chinese? It's absurd when you consider the work that is being done in India and China today in the very field of his study. I asked Dr. Strauss how Niemer could refute Mahdi's attack on his method and results if Niemer couldn't even read them in the first place. That strange look on Dr. Strauss's face could only mean one of two things. Either he doesn't want to tell Niemer what they're saying in India, or else, and this worries me, Dr. Strauss doesn't know either. I must be careful to speak and write clearly and simply so that people won't laugh. May 18th. I'm very disturbed. I saw Miss Kinian last night for the first time in over a week. I tried to avoid all discussions of intellectual concepts and to keep the conversation on a simple everyday level, but she just stared at me blankly and asked me what I meant about the mathematical variance equi equivalent in Doberman's fifth concerto. I tried to explain. She stopped me and laughed. I guess I got angry, but I suspect I'm approaching her on the wrong level. No matter what I try to discuss with her, I am unable to communicate. I must review Vorstadt's equation on the semantic progression. I find that I don't communicate with people much anymore. Thank God for books and music and things I can think about. I'm alone in my apartment at Mrs. Flynn's boarding house most of the time and seldom speak to anyone. May 20th. I would not have noticed the new dishwasher, a boy about 16, at the corner diner where I take my evening meals, if not for the incident of the broken dishes. They crash to the floor, shattering and sending bits of white china under the tables. The boy stood there, dazed and frightened, holding the empty tray in his hand. The whistles and catcalls from the customers, the cries of, hey, there goes, there go the prophets, Mazel Tov, and well, he didn't work here very long, which invariably seems to follow the breaking of glass or dishware in a public restaurant, all seem to confuse him. When the owner, Carney, came to see what the excitement was about, the boy cowered as if he expected to be struck and threw up his antis as if to ward off the blow all right all right you dope shouted the owner don't just stand there get the broom and sweep that mess up a broom a broom you idiot it's in the kitchen sweep up all the pieces the boy saw that he was not going to get punished his frightened expression disappeared and he smiled and hummed as he came back with the broom to sweep the floor a few of the rottier customers kept up the remarks amusing themselves at his expense here, Sonny, over here, there's a nice piece behind you. Come on, do it again. He's not so dumb. It's easier to break him than to wash him. As his vacant eyes moved across the crowd of amused onlookers, he slowly mirrored their smiles and finally broke into an uncertain grin at the joke, which he obviously did not understand. I felt sick inside as I looked at his dull, Vacious smile, the wide, bright eyes of a child, uncertain but eager to please. They were laughing at him merely because he was mentally retarded. And I had been laughing at him too. Suddenly, I was furious at myself and all of those who were smirking at him. I jumped up and shouted, Shut up! Leave him alone! It's not his fault he can't understand. He can't help what he is, and for God's sake, he's still a human being. The room grew silent. I cursed myself for losing control and creating a scene. I tried not to look at the boy as I paid my check and walked out without touching my food. I felt ashamed for both of us. How strange it is that people of honest feelings and sensibility who would not take advantage of a man born without arms or legs or eyes, how such people think nothing of abusing a man born with low intelligence. It infuriated me to think that not long, too long ago, I, like this boy, had foolishly played the clown. And I had almost forgotten. I'd hidden the picture of the old Charlie Gordon from myself because now I was that, was that intelligent. It was something that had to be pushed out of my mind. 
But today, in looking at that boy, for the first time, I saw what I had been. I was just like him. Only a short time ago, I learned that people laughed at me. Now I can see the unknowingly I joined with them in laughing at myself. That hurts most of all. I often reread my progress reports and seen the illiteracy, the childish naivete, the mind of a low intelligence peering from a dark room through the keyhole at the dazzling light outside. I see that even in my dullness, I knew what I was. I knew that I was inferior, and that other people had something I lacked, something denied me. In my mental blindness, I thought that it was somehow connected to the ability to read and write, and I was sure that I could get those skills. I, if I could get those skills, I would automatically have intelligence too. Even a feeble-minded man wants to be like other men. A child may not know how to feed itself or what to eat, yet it knows of hunger. This, then, is what I was like. I never knew. Even with my gift of intellectual awareness, I never really knew. This day was good for me. Seeing past more clearly, I have decided the past more clearly, I've decided to use my knowledge and skills to work in the field of increasing human intelligence levels. Who better equipped for the work? Who else has lived in both worlds? These are my people. Let my gift let me use my gift to do something for them. Tomorrow I will discuss with Dr. Strauss the manner in which I can work in this area. I may be able to help him work out the problems of widespread use of the technique on which was used on me. I have several good ideas of my own. There is so much that might be done with this technique. If I could be made into a genius, what about the thousands of others like myself? What fantastic levels might be achieved by using this technique on normal people, on geniuses? There are so many doors to open. I am impatient to begin.